Hello YouTube, it's Dust Gregor, and I know, before I get all the comments, where have you been? I'm sorry. Work has been very busy lately, and I know I've warned you a couple times if you've seen some of my older videos, that sometimes it's going to get in the way of having fun with Linux. And I have to focus on work first. I've been doing a lot of traveling over the last couple of weeks. I tried to do a video a couple of weeks ago. I made a huge mistake. So if you're watching this and you saw you're one of those few, I think 35 to 40 people watched it before I realized what went wrong and just got rid of it. <clears throat> And I apologize. I made a video about the discussion I'm going to talk about today. And I was in such a hurry because I was needing to get out the door to, to head out to another part of the state. But I really wanted to give you guys some content. And I, I always normally test my microphone and test my volumes and make sure things are proper. Something was royally hosed with my box's sound that day. I made a quick video, I uploaded it, threw it on there, and then I left. Halfway down the road, a couple hundred miles later, I start getting comments. Dude, your sound is horrible. And do you ever listen to what you do first? Is there any quality control? And, oh, I felt bad because I, I flipped on, I had enough signal, I was getting where I was driving. I wasn't driving, somebody else was driving, I was the passenger, so don't get upset if I'm reading, talking about, talking about my phone, yeah, I'm driving. No, I can't do that. No, I never do that. I don't ever condone it either. But any which way, I was the passenger in the vehicle, so I had a chance to look at my emails, and I saw these comments, and I thought, what's wrong? So luckily I was in a strong signal location, I checked the video on YouTube, and I realized how bad the sound was and I immediately just went straight to my videos and deleted it because I was like oh man 35 to 40 people have seen this so far and this is bad quality I was just in such a hurry to try to get you guys something because I'd missed it the previous week when I was out of town and I knew that I was gonna be out of town again for another week or so and I didn't know when I was gonna get back to being able to do another video this is it so, without further ado, I hope you tip, accept that apology. We'll move on, and let's talk about what I wanted to talk about a couple weeks ago. And that is Gen 2's new live DVD. Yes, you heard right, folks. Gen 2 has come out with a live DVD after a couple years of being in hiding. So... If we open up our Chromium browser and we go to www.gen2.org and we go to downloads and we scroll down a little bit and other media you will see that on August 26 2014 that Gen 2 came out with a new DVD. The last time they did so was on December 21st, 2012. And this is a very nice live DVD. If you ever want to showcase or show people Gen 2 without having to install it first, this is a quick and easy way to just kind of throw it on there and let them play with it. Now, the only complaint I might have about this is it would have been really nice if they would have had an easy way to give someone a starter from their live DVD to just say put this onto the hard drive and allow me to boot and use this as my operating system from this snapshot and go forward. Now, I have not found a way to do that just yet but it sure would have been a neat feature I know the whole point for some is with Gen 2 to install it from scratch and do it themselves, 
but if you really want to get into it, it would have been kind of nice, kind of like how I've said with Calculate Linux. I really feel Calculate Linux is one of the best flavors of Gen 2 based OS's that will allow you to install it and then run with it from there and actually have a fully working Gen 2 box straight from a live DVD. Excellent resource. But going back to this live media here, I use this quite a bit on my travels in the last couple weeks. I was able, instead of taking both my personal laptop and my work laptop, I was able to take a dis this distribution, put it on a large USB, in my case I actually had a 32 gig USB, and then I was actually able to make it persistent so I could install applications and I could run programs and I'm kind of a Minecraft fan. I do enjoy watching Minecraft on YouTube. In fact, if you ever saw what my most of my viewing history, sadly enough it's not Linux, but it's actually Minecraft. <laughs> and I wanted to be able to play Minecraft in Linux without putting anything on my work computer. And this enabled me to have a fully operational version of Gen 2 on a USB stick with persistent storage, being able to install Java and the Technic Launcher because one of my favorite versions of Minecraft, one of the most excellent flavors that they've done is Attack of the Bee Team. I love all the mods in that version of modded Minecraft. But that's another subject altogether. With this USB key, I was able to have that operating system. I was able to know that everything could be safe in a Linux environment, in a hotel environment as well. And I was able to have my familiar operating system without having to take a second personal laptop. In the meantime, I was secure in knowing that I wasn't doing anything at all to my work laptop and that everything was you know, safe on its end and that I didn't have to put any new software that I wasn't authorized to do. Now I am IT and of course I've got all kinds of rights to my laptop which normal users would normally not have but that doesn't give me the right to break company policies of installing things on it that aren't supposed to be there and I do follow those rules as I do point out to the customers I support that they have to follow. So being able to use this USB stick allowed me to boot into the Gen 2 platform be able to install software onto the Gen 2 or onto this USB stick for Gen 2 and be able to run a fully operational version of Gen 2 without any worries to what hardware. And the great cool thing about this is I pretty much can take that USB stick and plug it into anything anywhere, boot to it and most likely have a working operating system with all my data, all my files, and everything ready for me right up front. A wonderful way to be able to do this. Now you say, Das Gregor, Das, yeah, how do you do that? How are you able to make it persistent? Well, let me show you real quick. If you go into this part here for released, it talks about this, and it even talks about how you should be able to run this on a Mac as well as on an Intel based machine. But if we go into, if you need or have any questions, please visit this discu our discussion threads right here at the forums. If you click on the forums here, this talks about what they've done and how it works even with UEFI and the Mac OS hardware. Yes, as they say, yes, you heard it right. These instructions are the most important ones that I found. If you do the DD if equals the image, that being the image of the Gen 2 ISO you've downloaded, to your USB stuck. In this case, they're assuming USB stuck is SDB, and this is the size of the bytes it's going to write. And afterwards, you then do an F disk of your USB stick and create a primary hard drive. In most cases, it's going to be SD and whatever uh, your hard drive label is. In my case, it was C because I've got two hard drives in this laptop. And so, F disking into dev SDC, I created SDC4, and then 
they have you making an ext2 file system on that i went ahead and made a ext4 file system only because that's what i normally use and it doesn't really matter as long as the kernel on the Gen 2 Live DVD can recognize it is all that matters because when you first boot up and it doesn't talk about that here when you first boot up you have to use a command on boot up so that it will know you want to use persistent drive mapping and what you see here is what you have to add to the boot up command line now every time you boot up you're going to have to add this AUFS equals slash dev slash sd whatever drive number in most cases in this case it's it's gonna be well i guess in mine it would still be sd uh, c4 and when you do this the very first time it's going to see that extra partition and it's going to ask you how big of a cache do you want to create how big of a persistent mapping do you want now in my case, I think I was able to create about a 25 gig partition, this being a 32 gig shtuk. Now, with being able to do that, it says it defaults, I think, to 256 megs. You don't want to use 256 megs. You want to be able to use as much of that partition that you create as possible. So I told it 25 gigs, and it went ahead and created then a file inside of that partition to use as its virtual drive whenever I logged in and made sure to use AUFS equals slash dev now slash SDB4. Another thing I want to make note and to tell you is that you need to be careful when you first boot up into your USB stuff. One of the mistakes that I was making is that when it first goes to detecting hardware and everything else, it will ask you for the default keyboard country code that you're needing to use. Now, because I mostly do everything with American English, I just have to hit the enter button, and that takes the default. Problem is, if I hit the enter button too quickly, it was not detecting the other partitions on my USB stuck, and therefore was failing at finding any partition to use for persistent mapping. What I found is a trick to do is to just allow it to do its normal timeout to give the system enough time that it would see all the hardware partitions, at which case I didn't have any trouble at all of it seeing the persistent mapping. And as I said before, I was able to install Java, I was able to install other applications that I wanted to be able to use within it. I could reboot and it would still be there. I could create files, I could edit files, I could customize things, and when I reboot it, as long as I use that AUFS equals in the directory or the partition for that file that it created, it worked wonderful. Now you ask about latency and you ask about, well, it's running everything off a of USB, won't that be a problem? There were some lags that I noticed. Sometimes there was a little bit of a delay in response and I can only imagine that that has to do with the fact that I was accessing a USB stick there on the system instead of it accessing directly a hard drive. There were a few issues for that but I did notice I could play Minecraft and other games and things like that without feeling that lag or feeling that there was any type of an issue with latency. It seemed to work quite well, even though it was off of the USB port instead of a hard drive within the system. A very good way to get started and play with the operating system, but then again, so is most other live DVDs. But if you're interested in Gen 2 and you're interested in seeing how it works with getting a little bit of a try, I did try to update the world while in it, and that failed there were some issues I think with the way the use flags were etc that it didn't like so you, you can't do that but for other issues of trying it out creating a persistent mapping and having something you can take with you everywhere and still be able to save data was a great thing I mean it kept me from having to take two computers with me on all my traveling over the last couple weeks so I hope you enjoyed this 
video about the live DVD for Gen 2. I'm apologizing again for the fact that I tried to do this in a rush and really screwed it up. And hopefully things can get back on track. I'm back where I am. I have only local travel now for a while and I should be able to get back to making videos more regularly and keeping things out there. I hope whatever you're having, whether it's morning, evening, or noon or night, that it's a good one. Thank you for your support. Thank you for the views. And tell me when something's not right. I do my best, but I'm a one-trick kind of guy. I don't like to do a lot of video editing. So whether I screw up or not, I sometimes leave it all there. But I do want to give you better audio quality and at least be able to make it so that you can hear me properly and see me. So until next time, thanks again. Goodbye, guys. Maybe. <laughs> oh, there we go.